Well, this is John Moulding, the Editor-in-Chief at VideoNet, and I'm with Tony Jones, who's the Principal Technologist at MediaKind. And this is part of the Connected TV World Series uh, Virtual Contents uh, Series. So welcome to you, Tony. Um, I mean, before we get going, just tell us a little bit about MediaKind. I know most people know you anyway, but just for anyone that's not aware of the company, just uh, give us a quick intro. So MediaKind span out of Ericsson uh, and on the 1st of February 2019. And it's largely comprised with companies that have a longer history in the media business. So Tamburg Television, Invivio Fabrics, and the TV platform business from Microsoft. So what we do is we cover media processing. So that includes transcoding and encoding for both linear and streaming applications. Um, and supporting that, we've got big in-house algorithm research team as well. We also do media delivery. So that's cloud DVR recording. Um, and also personalization, advertising, rights management, processing. Um, and finally, we have a fairly substantial TV platforms business. So many people will be familiar with the Media Room um, platform, uh, but also more recent Media First platform too. So that's okay. Media Kind. Great. Okay. And I know compression is was always at the very heart of your business. And I'm just wondering whether, as we look towards streaming and the future of streaming, uh, 5G networks are coming and we're told they, they will really massively ramp up the bandwidth. Smart Wi-Fi is available in homes. That's having a potentially big impact on how much data can actually be transported from the sort of gateway to devices. I mean, do we still need to keep pushing on hard on compression or does compression now become less important? 5G and smart Wi-Fi are certainly interesting increases in capacity that's available. Um, of course, where they, where they apply that additional capacity varies depending on whether it's fixed wireless or, or mobile. But it's also true that the demand for capacity is significantly outstripping the increase in provision of capacity. So it doesn't seem like any time soon that the need for more efficiency is going to go away. And in fact, if you can include the trend towards 4K as well, um, then we can see that the demand for better compression is certainly going to be in place for a long time yet. Um, included on 5G and smart Wi-Fi networks. Okay, and is there still plenty of um, room to improve compression? I mean, you know, we've we've gone on sort of generally jumped at 50% improvements each time. Is there another 50% sitting there, or when do we hit the bottom? Um, yes, I mean, each each um, generation of coding standards has offered roughly 40% of theoretical improvement from um, from the reference encoder point of views points of view. Um, and, and that's true for the next generation ones too, and we'll see those coming through fairly shortly. But there's also a second point, which is within a given encoding standard, then the implementation of the encoder is at least as important as the standard itself. And um, as we go through it, we found that we've been able to reduce the bit rates for the same encoding standards. Um, and, and that's still the case for MPEG-2, believe it or not. Yes, yeah, we always forget about MPEG-2, but there's still still a need to keep on pushing that one as well. I mean, in terms of streaming then, um, are we still looking at really putting our, our biggest efforts into improving unicast? When I, and I'm thinking about live and linear now. Or are we sort of, is it time to really put all the effort into multicast ABR? And is that the future of live and linear streaming? I think we've got two threads that are going to take place here. One is is going to be for the wired environment where there's an ability to do things on the network, which is um, a bit more specific to those networks. And I think in those environments, we'll see multicast delivery of some form playing a, an increasing role. Um, it's possibly the most, most interesting area to explore over the next few years, but it's not going to be something that solves all the problems in all the environments. So we've got to live with the fact that uh, unicast is going to be prevalent for handheld devices um, and anywhere where management of the network isn't really an option. So I think we'll see um, probably a, a split in the technologies used, um, which is not what some people might have imagined, which is Unicast solves everything on the planet. But I think we've actually got a slightly more complex environment that we'll be working in. Yeah, I might have imagined actually that everything would switch to multicast at some point, but you, d you don't think that will happen? <clears throat> I don't think that'll happen for some technical reasons um, and for some operational reasons. The technical reasons are that on 5G, um, the bandwidth efficiency for multicast isn't as good if you're going point to a single point as it would be for a unicast delivery for some detailed RF reasons. Um, 
and also multicast over Wi-Fi has some constraints as well. So that there are some reasons why perhaps it won't get to everywhere. Um, but for live, it's clearly beneficial in any way that you've got the ability to deliver multicast to UDP and then deliver onwards from there to a client. Okay. Well, whether it's unicast or multicast then, um, in terms of latency, I think there's a lot of um, work at the moment on sort of reducing latency. It's quite a big impact on quality of experience. You know, the, we've all heard about the cheers next door before you've seen the goal, et cetera. Um, at the moment, as I understand it, delays could be up to 60 seconds, you know, 45 to 60 seconds. Um, you've got a solution that gets that down to three to seven seconds, which you introduced last September, I think. Um, I mean, what have you actually done? Okay, so there are two aspects to what's changing in there. Um, one is to do with the use of um, CMAF low latency chunk trans and chunk transfer encoding, which eliminates some of the delays be that are unnecessary between, for example, the, the uh, a packager and a CDN node. So, so one of the issues is that with ABR in its original form, you have to wait until the entire segment is complete before you know the length of it. And only at that point can you signal onwards what the length of the transfer is to the next stage. Clearly that's an issue because every time you do that, you've got maybe six seconds or, or four seconds if, in, if you've got a slightly lower segment length. And you add those up, it adds up to a lot over a number of, of links. So using um, CMAF uh, low latency encoding and chunk transfer encoding together allows you to start moving data along the chain a lot earlier because you only wait for, for a piece of that data to be, to be ready. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect that we've added in recently is called direct path. And what that's doing is changing the way that the data is connected from the encoder to the packager stage. Traditionally, we would have turned that into a multi-rate constant bit rate type uh, connection. So it deli gets delivered in real time as if it was going to the home. Uh, however, with direct path, what we do is we move the data as soon as it's available. So as soon as you have a big iframe's worth of data, it can move straight to the packager. Um, and that allows you to eliminate a fairly significant amount of, of latency from the system as well. Um, of course, neither of those de deal with the client end of it, which is the rest of the delay, but th between them, they're quite a significant benefit in terms of reductions. Okay, and in, and in terms of what content owners and operators are asking for, is three to seven the sweet zone? Do we need to get below that at all, or are the plans to go lower? I think there's always somebody going to ask for a lower latency than um, is currently the, the vogue. However, the reality is that anything below about seven to 10 seconds is going to be of the same order as a, uh, a broadcast type delivery. And it's also um, enough time that uh, it's, it's a short enough time that nobody's going to be able to have dealt with um, sending a Twitter feed and provided some data direct from the venue. Um, it, and for that to have got to the consumer faster than you've seen the, the content through the streaming path. Yeah, okay. I mean, last year at IBC, the DVB had this big showpiece on their stand, which was really their sort of look at what the, the post-broadcast world would look like. And we all know the work they did to sort of make the sort of the DVB-T uh, world happen, so digital broadcast. Um, and it involved multicast ABR, low latency streaming, and also service discovery uh, capabilities. And their sort of mantra is obviously interoperability, and it always has been. Um, for example, multicast ABR, you'd have the server, encoder, and client manufacturers it could all be different. I mean, do you think we need that kind of interoperability and that standards push in this market? I mean, you know, it is working. We know that uh, lots of people have end-to-end -end solutions and they work great. I mean, you know, there's a market out there. Do we need it? And do we need it at this point? The, I think it's what's well, always desirable to have agreed standards across the industry. And that's, that's definitely the pref preferred outcome. It's always been our company's preferred outcome uh, across the board. The need to try and get a low latency but scalable solution for streaming is something that needs attention across every step along the way of the, the, the part of the chain. And that includes the operator stage as well. And at the moment, uh, that appears to be missing as part of the, the consideration for the DVB work. <clears throat> um, if that can be resolved, then maybe we can get to somewhere that could be used um, ubiquitously. But right now, there are some proprietary st stages within that overall network, which means it isn't genuinely going to be fully open. 
And I think this, this is going to be some of one of the areas that we're going to have to look at if we want to migrate it to a more standards based approach. Um, and we should also consider the fact that there's a little bit of a contradiction between multicast ABR and low latency as well, because a multicast ABR stage inherently adds some latency that you didn't want. So there is a bit of conflict in, in here, um, yeah. but it would be good to get to an answer on that one. Yeah. What kind of low, uh, what kind of latency does multicast ABR add in? Are we talking seconds or tens of seconds? In, in its original format, which is the Cable Labs version um, that came out of the US um, markets, it would typically add one to two segments worth of latency um, additionally within uh, the, the pipeline. Now, it's possible that could be reduced somewhat because of the um, chunk transfer encoding, um, but it's, it's definitely going to add latency where you didn't want it. Um, yeah. and, and as what's, we know, you know the, the segment is that sort of six to ten seconds. A, a segment would be six to ten seconds. That's right. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. and one of the things that we, we always need to bear in mind is that the scenario where latency is most important happens also to be the, the same environment where the scalability is at its peak. In other words, it's a big sporting event with lots of people watching it. And at the same time, it's high value content and so has, has the highest expectations in the quality of delivery. So solving parts of the problem really doesn't get us to the full picture. We have to be able to solve all of those concurrently um, and for the big screen primarily because that's where the high value content has its most value. Of course, okay. Well, let's talk about CDNs then. Um, they are obviously in the front line in terms of the capacity challenge. Um, is there a way that we can increase their capacity and reduce their costs? I mean, ideally do both. Are there any step changes coming in terms of CDN efficiencies or is the best we would hope for incremental improvements or you know, small steps? There are a couple of um, significant changes that will help that for sure. Um, one of them is is to make the CDNs much more um, media specific. And with that, the ability to be able to deliver the same form of content to lots of different clients, even if it's, even if it's packaged differently. So a just-in-time packager function, which can be at the edge of the network, means that you only have to keep one copy of an asset locally at the edge of the CDN, and you could deliver... Um, either Apple HLS format or dash CMAF to, um, to different clients based on the same stored asset, which also then reduces the amount of traffic across the network. Now, that only works once you've got a common media format underneath, and it's something that the um, media player organizations have been working towards. So both um, Apple and Dash are working towards having a common format, which is Dash um, C, sorry, not Dash, but CMAF, common encryption with CVCS um, encryption format on that, which can then be used across different devices regardless of whether it's HLS or, or Dash. And that, that has a significant improvement. Okay, great. So, so that would be uh, just one kind of version going over the, the core of the network, and then at the edge we split it and create the separate ones. That's right. The other part of it that goes with it, of course, is the ongoing improvements in video compression formats. So at the moment, the vast, vast majority of streamed content is still using AVC, um, MPEG-4 by other words. However, um, HEVC is now well established and in most client devices as an available decode format um, for free content. AV1 is a good contender as well. And Coming to standardization this year, we have EV, uh, sorry, EVC and VVC. And VVC is particularly interesting because, once again, it takes about another 40% step down in, in bit rate requirement beyond HEVC, which is quite, quite incredible, to be honest. But yeah, it still has yeah. that potential in it. Brilliant. Okay. And then I guess the, the, the million-dollar question is, when will we be ready for an all-streamed World Cup or Olympics? So these giant events where we could have 20 million people in a country like the size of Europe, uh, Germany or UK watching, um, you know, is that remotely realistic in the next five years? Probably in the next five years, it will be available to everybody, but it seems unlikely it will be the only format within the next five years, um, mainly because the ability to do a delivery at scale to a large number of people with a great great expectation um, of quality um, and low latency 
doesn't look like it's all going to happen and be ubiquitous within five years. Um, within 10 years, maybe. Um, five years might be a bit of a challenge. It's probably borderline at best, I would say, for that. Okay. Brilliant. All right. Well, that's, that's uh, fascinating stuff. And um, we love hearing about streaming. So thank you very much for your time today, Tony. And uh, it's great talking to you. Thank you. Right, well, thank you to uh, our audience for listening.